That's so awesome. Hey, good morning. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here at Westbridge. Awesome to have you with us today. And I want to say hello to everybody joining us on our online campus as well. Uh, thanks for participating with us. Before we jump in, uh, a couple quick things I got to say. These are all the flat tires from yesterday. <laughs> Literally all the flat tires. So seven flat tires we got yesterday, which is amazing. Uh, it just speaks to the commitment that these guys had. And uh, I want to say a couple of, uh, a couple of guys I want to highlight. Uh, we had one guy who at mile 50 was just cramping up so bad, and it was like, man, I don't know if I can continue. But uh, he kept going and uh, went f till mile 85. And I'm telling you, those last 35 miles, he fought for every one of those miles. And finally just said, I, I, I got to call it quits. I'm, I'm concerned I might injure myself. But man, he fought for those uh, last 35 miles. Uh, we had another guy who had, uh, like, I think two or three of these belonged to one guy. And it's like, dude, he's just like going through tires like crazy. And, uh, but fought for every mile that he got. We had another guy who uh, his bike broke. He could still pedal. The pedal still worked, but he couldn't shift into any other gears. And if you, <laughs> <there's> a, <laughs> I want the online audience to know that there has been a collective groan through the audience here. Uh, and so he, that was at mile 30, and he was stuck in like one of the toughest gears, and he still finished the, ra the ride. Uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So going downhill was great, but man, any uphill, he would, and he would just like, raw, just grinding it out, which was amazing. And then we had another guy who uh, uh, had to leave early for a wedding, so did the first 30 miles before everybody else. So he got back to church as we were leaving, and so the last, our first 70 was his last 70. And so he got the 100 in and still went to the wedding. And so uh, this is just, man, these guys had such commitment to this thing, so that was awesome. And I want to say thanks to... Um, all of the people that were doing vehicles, all of the people that were providing snacks and support and cheering and making signs, all of the people who donated, uh, and uh, our video editor who took all of the footage from yesterday and put that video together last night to have it ready for today. So awesome, huge collective effort from everybody. It's a big win. And uh, this is just a visual to the sacrifice that uh, these guys made throughout the day. Now, we have been uh, in a series called Foundations. The goal of this is that every year during this season, we take some time and we refocus and we realign our whole uh, church and our, 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 uh, really our, our whole um, church family around the mission of the church and make sure that we're all rowing in the same direction. Because what happens is uh, throughout the year, throughout the summer, especially when you look at uh, the last sort of year that we've had, uh, it, it's easy to drift. It's easy to lose sight of why did we start this church? What is the mission of the church? And so the mission has always been the same, and it's given to us from Jesus, and the mission is to help people find and follow Jesus. We want to be people who help other people discover Jesus, discover what it's like to find Jesus, and then walk together as we work to follow Jesus. And so uh, we take a few weeks during this season as we head into the school year, and we realign and we refocus and make sure that we're all moving in the same direction. So we started this series talking about grace, <clears throat> that grace is the engine that drives everything, and that we have received grace freely from God, and so freely we give grace to others. And, and this idea of grace is what helps us to rewrite the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, and that when we do that, not only do we see ourselves the way God sees us, but we start to help other people see themselves the way that God sees them, and we see other people the way God sees them. And so grace is important. It's the engine that drives everything. And then uh, the second week, we talked about community. And we said following Jesus isn't just a vertical morality. It's not just about check the boxes and obey the rules. It has to actually uh, make a difference in other people's lives. It has to move horizontally so that we're living together in community, that we help one another, serve one another, love one another, forgive one another, and bear with each other, and, and all of these one another's and that uh, as a part of being a part of the body of Christ. And so we've got a, a whole new catalog of groups coming out in just a couple of weeks. That's an easy way to respond to that and be involved in groups. Last week, we talked about serving others, that part of following Jesus means we give of our time and energy to serve other people, and that uh, when we invite people to this place, and we're seeing a lot of new faces walk through our doors, we want to be ready for them. And we give of our time and our energy to serve because we follow Jesus, who himself said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. 
And that we get to do that. And so last week, we were wearing these shirts, Say Yes, right? And we talked about serving. And a whole bunch of you uh, took a tag and said, I'm going to jump into a team. And you can still do that this week. There's still a a number of uh, options to join a team. And if this is your church home and you're not a part of a serving team, I want to encourage you to jump into a serving team. It's one of the best ways that you can get connected and be involved here at Westbridge Church. And then finally, uh, we're in our fourth one. Next week will be our fifth one. We'll wrap up this series. Today we're talking about our fourth value. And our fourth value is generosity. Now, I know what you're thinking. I love when the church talks about money. Oh, mm, my favorite. (laughs) I also know that in every conversation, three things are happening. There's what I intend to say, there's what I actually say, and then there's what somebody hears. Right? And so my hope is that uh, today, as we talk about generosity, it's my prayer that you don't hear fundraising. I hope that's what you do not hear. That's not at all the goal here this morning. My prayer is that you actually hear spiritual maturity. That this is about growing in your walk with Jesus, growing in uh, learning and discovering what it looks like to follow Jesus in this area. And then as we explore these values together through this series, my, my prayer is that it will help you surrender every area of your life to the God who created you and the God who loves you, and that you'll continually learn to trust him and follow his way of living life, understanding that because he created you and because he created life, he knows the best way to live it, and he has your best interest in mind. So we're going to approach this topic not from a standpoint of, hey, we really want something from you, but we just want something for you. I want something for you, and I hope that comes ringing through today. So as we tackle this topic, we're going to start with a very common misconception around money and generosity. And here it is. Number one, when it comes to money, we think it's about more. That's the general misconception is it's about more. If I had more money, then I'd be more happy and I'd be more generous. If I had more money, I would be more happy and I'd be more generous. So let me ask you a question. How much more money would it take for you to be more happy and more generous? And I know the answer for you because it's probably the same answer that I have. More than I currently have. Right? I don't know exactly. I couldn't maybe put an exact number on it, but I know it's more. And yet, here's what's amazing about this. We all know people. My guess is you know people. I know people who have more financially than I do, but they do not have more happiness and they're not more generous. And I know people who have less materialistically less financially, who seem to have more joy, who seem to have more happiness, who seem to be more generous. It's amazing, isn't it? And so what's the deal? King Solomon actually said it like this a a few thousand years ago, those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Every lottery winner knows that that's true, right? (laughs) So what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? And and it's amazing. We have modern theologians saying the same thing today, right? Modern theologians like Notorious B.I.G. Mo money, mo problems. (laughs) And all he's doing is paraphrasing Ecclesiastes 5. Solomon said this thousands of years ago, right? Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. And it's amazing. This is not a 21st century issue. This is a human issue. This is a, this is a, our, our the, the human race has been struggling with this concept for thousands and thousands of years. And we can't seem to figure out the connection between generosity and happiness and more. And that's because our belief is that it's about more. But when it comes to money, Jesus said it's about management. It's not about more. It's not about the amount. It's about management. Jesus taught it's not about how much you have. It's about how you manage however much you have been given. Because generosity, it's, it's much less of a money issue, and it's much more of a heart issue and a trust issue. Do I genuinely believe that God is who he says he is and that he will provide for me like he promised to? And it's less about more, and it's a lot more about management. Maybe you've never thought about your money this way. Jesus actually said that you can't take any of it with you, but you can send it on ahead. You can't take your money with you, but you can send it on ahead. What does that mean? Here's what Jesus taught, and he's he's actually speaking in this section of verses to a large group of people. He's he's showing them, here's what it looks like to live in the way of Jesus, to enter into and participate in God's kingdom here on earth. And he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. 
Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And we all know what storing something up means, right? In, in, it means to set aside so that we can have something later. And what does it mean to store up treasures in heaven? What is Jesus saying when he says, store up treasures in heaven? And I don't think there's a, like, first, you know, United Bank of Heaven. I don't know. Like, you go in and there's, like, a deposit box. Like, there's all the stuff I stored up from earth. I don't think it's that. I, I'm not sure there's even money in heaven. So what does it mean to store up treasure in heaven? And I think that it means that if we take a portion of what God has entrusted to us here in this life and we invest it in things that have eternal impact, that that is how we store up treasure. Things like people and their eternal life. Then you'll actually be making an investment in your own future. You'll actually be making an investment in your own, uh, in your own future. And that's smart, by the way. If you ask any financial planner, and if you ask them, should I spend all of my money now, or should I save some of it? Every financial planner will tell you, yes, you should definitely save some of it for the future, right? And Jesus would say the best way to invest in your own future is to invest in those things that have eternal impact. And so if we're going to leave a legacy as a church and as individuals with the way that we handle whatever God has entrusted to us, it's not about more, it's about managing. And The question we ask is, after I die, how will I wish my money would have made an impact? Well, we can send it ahead. And my seven-year-old loves shoes. My seven-year-old absolutely loves shoes, and yet most of the shoes that we buy him are from garage sales. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why we don't buy our seven-year-old, you know, $200 KDs. Because his feet are still growing. Uh, He's one of the taller seven-year-olds that I've seen, and I think he's going to keep growing. And pretty soon we'll be saying, you can't wear these anymore because you've outgrown them. And do you know what's true of all of us? Maybe your feet are done growing, but the truth is we all outgrow things. He's not alone. One day you're going to outgrow your house. One day you're going to, may not seem like it right now, but you'll, you'll outgrow it in some way. You're like, no, we got plenty of space, but you'll have to move to a single level house, right? As, as your knees, as you get older, you'll have to move to assisted living facility. One day you're going to outgrow your car. At some point, that thing isn't going to last forever. You're going to outgrow your phone. You're going to outgrow your computer. With that in mind, does it make any sense at all? Does it make any sense to take all of your earthly money and invest it into things that you will outgrow? To take all of your earthly money and invest it in things that you will outlast. Look at what Jesus says a few verses later. He says, so don't worry about having enough food or drink or clothing. Why be like the pagans who are so deeply concerned about these things? He says, look, if you're going to participate in the kingdom of God here and now here on this earth... This is what it looks like. Now, if you're not participating in the kingdom of God and you're living life for yourself and on your own, then it makes sense every day to worry about these things. It makes sense every day to be concerned. Man, what am I gonna what am I gonna wear? And what am I gonna are we gonna have enough food and and kind of living day to day and paycheck to paycheck and wondering where it's gonna come from and trying to lean into that and make sure. He says, but people who aren't participating in the kingdom of God here on earth. That's how they live. And it makes sense for them to live that way. But if you're participating in God's kingdom, he says, your heavenly father already knows all your needs. And he'll give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. And Jesus says, don't store up treasure here on earth. Store it up in heaven. And then he says, oh, by the way, don't worry about all these earthly things. If your focus and attention and priorities are on God's kingdom, he's going to provide what you need. And I think a lot of times, maybe we've heard, if you've been around church at all, you've heard maybe this section of verses and this section of verses, and you don't realize that these two are actually connected. It's the same talk that Jesus is giving. And he he seems to be saying that, man, if you will invest your money in something that's eternal, not only will you have less and less worry around those things that are not eternal. If if you'll invest your money in things that have eternal impact, the, the amount that you focus on and are worried about and have concern around these temporary things actually diminishes quite a bit. And on the contrary, if you invest all your earthly money in earthly things, you're going to worry a lot about those earthly things. You're going to spend all your time worrying and concerned about and thinking about those things. Why? Because Jesus says, and we know it's true, your heart follows your money. That's why some of you, you didn't care at all about the NFL until you joined a fantasy football team. And now all of a sudden, you're like rooting for a third string running back on the Cleveland Browns to get like, you know, across the goal line because you're like, I got 20 bucks riding on this. You suddenly know the names of like uh, football players that are on a 10-day contract because somehow, man, if they just score one more point, I win 20 bucks this week. 
Because your heart follows your money. We know that that's true. It's like if you bought a stock, you never once looked at that stock before. But all of a sudden, you're checking your app every day, like, how's my stock doing? How's my stock doing? You're driving through the cities, and you see, like, uh, an office building from that company that you bought stock in, and you're, like, pointing it out to people in the car. You're like, I'm part owner in that company. (laughs) It's why teenagers don't generally love watching HGTV, because they've never spent money on anything having to do with a house. But all of a sudden, those same teenagers become young adults. And they meet someone, and they get married, and they start having kids, and they buy a house. And one weekend, one of them goes, what do you want to do today? And the other one goes, you want to go to the parade of homes? (laughs) And the response is like, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. (laughs) Like, what happened to us? That's hypothetical. I'm just. (laughs) Your heart followed your money, right? And wherever we invest our financial resources, our hearts become deeply invested in those things. That's why if we want to have our hearts deeply invested in participating in the mission of helping people find and follow Jesus, it makes sense that we direct our financial resources there. We want to be a part of what God is up to in our community. We direct our financial resources towards God's kingdom because our heart follows that investment. And here's what's amazing. God promises that when we do that, not only do we get to participate in what he's up to in the world, not only do we get to send that on ahead of us, but we actually have our basic needs, the things that we're concerned about, our earthly needs. He says, I'll take care of those. That's the promise from God. And isn't that what all of us want? Don't all of us want to make an investment in our own future? Don't we want more joy? Don't we want to be uh, more generous and experience the happiness that comes from living a generous life? And wouldn't every one of us say, man, I really do want my life to make a difference. And I really do want my, my life to, to leave a legacy that outlives me. And I really, I want to hear the stories of people whose lives are forever changed because I was willing to invest what God had entrusted to me. And Jesus says there is a way you can do that. It's through giving. It's through taking a percentage of everything God entrusts to you and investing it into his work here in the world. Now, what does that mean? What, what does it mean to give? What, is, what, is this, what do the scriptures teach on here's how you do that, right? And it, it's pretty uh, basic. It's pretty fundamental. But let's walk through that for just a few minutes. Number one, the scriptures teach give to God first. Give to God first. Make it a priority. Your giving is either going to be passive and spontaneous or it's going to be active and intentional. Passive and spontaneous means every time that I see, uh, you know, uh, the, the right plea or I, I see something that kind of moves my heart a little bit and I have an emotional response, every once in a while I think I'll do that. Active and intentional means, okay, every time that I receive money, every time that I get paid, I'm taking a chunk of that and I'm returning it first back to God. I'm being active and I'm being intentional with it. Here's what uh, Solomon writes in Proverbs 3, honor God with everything you own, give him the first and the best. Here's what that means. When you get paid, and this isn't just in Proverbs, this is taught all throughout the scriptures, that whenever we get something from God and we recognize he's the owner, we're not. We're simply the managers. When we, whenever we receive, that we take and we give back to God first, that we return back to God first. And when we do that, it's an act of faith. It's saying, God, I trust that if I will return to you first, that you will help me to live on the rest. Now, that's not how our culture tends to operate. Our culture tends to operate like this. Whenever I get paid, I'm going to spend it on me. I'm going to pay my bills. I'm going to do the things I need to do to make sure that I can live. And if there's any leftover after that, I might save a little bit. And if there's any leftover after that, then it's like, God, I'm going to give you a little bit too. But only if there's some leftovers. It's like, it's kind of like a little, it's a little tip. Hey, God, man, thanks for the, thanks for the grace and I appreciate the eternal life and whatnot. I do have a little leftover. I'm going to give that to you. And here's the reality. Here's the reality. That's how our culture tends to live. It's human nature. I want to take care of myself first, and then if I have some left. And for most of us, we we live in this culture that is very uh, consumer-driven mindset. And so our live and and, uh, myself bucket tends to be pretty big. And all the scriptures teach is this. Why don't we just shift that? Why don't we give to God first, and then save a little, and then live out of what is left? And... When we make that shift, and if you've been around here for any number of years, and any time we teach on this, this is the principle that we teach. Give, then save, then live on the rest. Give, save, live. Give, save, live. And if you'll do that, you'll always be generous, and you'll always have peace. Now, that might sound incredibly self-serving, because you go, well, aren't you the pastor of the church here, and isn't that like the preacher answer, and you say that, and then that's... Let me just tell you something. 
This is something, and this is so important for you to hear. This is something that I live this way. Our family lives this way. Uh, people on staff live this way. We are not asking you to do something that we are not going to lead the way in. Number one, you need to know that. Secondly, uh, this isn't some clever scheme cooked up so that pastors can pay their rent, okay? You need to know that. Like, if I wanted to make a, a bunch more money, I would have been in a different career. I probably would have gone, like, into modeling or something. So, uh, <laughs> But I have a new understanding of wealth, a brand new understanding of wealth. I don't see my money and my stuff as my own. I am simply the manager of what God has entrusted. In fact, in 15 years since we started this church, which, uh, by the way, today is the 15-year anniversary of our very first launch team meeting. <laughs> now, yeah, it's amazing. Not our first service, just the first time that we gathered in a living room and said, hey, we think we want to start a church. Huh? And people were like... Yeah, let's do it. So that was on August 29th, 2006. So uh, it just popped into my head. Uh, so in 15 years, here's a phrase we've never used at this church. Now's the time during the service where we're going to take the offering. Now, I've heard that in other places, but we're not taking anything. What you've heard us say for 15 years is this. Hey, this is a time in our service where we get to, as a part of our worship, we get to bring back a percentage of what God has entrusted to us financially. That language is very specific that way intentionally because we want to we understand we're not taking anything. We're simply returning out of what has been entrusted to us. And when we do that first, it's an act of faith. It's an act of saying, God, I recognize this actually, you're the owner and I'm the manager and I'm returning to you what you've entrusted to me. In fact, uh, I, this helps, this analogy helps me when I think about this. Uh, when, my, when my kids were younger and uh, we, we'd love to go to movies, and especially when they were younger, they'd be like, hey, can we get a candy? And everybody get to pick out one candy. And, and I remember this time where um, one of my kids got Skittles, and one of my other kids said, hey, can I have some of your Skittles? And I bought all the candy, right? And so everybody got to pick one thing, and all of a sudden one kid says to the other kid, can I have some of your Skittles? And here was the immediate response from the kid who owned the Skittles in their own mind. No, they're mine. And I got to tell you, as the one who purchased all the Skittles, that didn't sit well with me. And I was like, oh, this kid forgot where the Skittles came from. They forgot who paid for the Skittles, who is the actual owner of the Skittles, and also that if I wanted to, I could have bought enough Skittles to bury her in Skittles and make her eat her way out. <laughs> so there's plenty more where that came from. We need to adopt a different mindset here, right? And on the flip side, here's what I love. I love this as a parent. It's one of my favorite things. When one kid says to the other one, hey, can I have some of that? And they're like, oh, sure. And they share with them. Then I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. I love that. You're, I provided those for you, and you're willing to share that. What else do you want? Do you want more Skittles? Have a bucket of Skittles. You, you want a car? You want a house? What do you want? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, wanna, I love that you're so generous, so I just want to give you more. I want to give you more. Why? Because it, it brings joy to my heart as a father, as a dad, when I see that one kid goes, hey, you know what? I'd, I was freely given this, and so I'm going to share it freely. And I wonder sometimes how quickly as human beings we take what God has given us because we don't own any of it, right? All throughout the scriptures there's this idea, naked you were born, naked you will die. Like that's it, right? You didn't come into this world with anything. You ain't taking anything with you. But you have it for a season. Why? Because God entrusts it to you. He owns it. We don't. And I wonder sometimes how quickly... We take ownership of something that actually belongs to God, and we think it's ours, and we're unwilling to share, and God's going, hey, can you share that? And we go, no, it's mine. And I wonder how that makes our Heavenly Father feel when something that He's freely entrusted to us, we're unwilling to share with other people. And on the flip side of that, I wonder what joy it brings to the heart of our Heavenly Father when he goes, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless your life. And we go, that's so great. Hey, I want to share this with other people. And I think God's like, what, what else do you want? Why, how can I bless you? And here's what's amazing. We don't give so that God will bless us. We give because God has already blessed us. It, there's not a if you, then God's just going to like, right? It's, there's no like, make Jesus your choice. Drive a Rolls Royce, right? That, it, that's not how it works. You're not going to find that verse anywhere, okay? But. When we settle the issue of ownership, we recognize it really belongs to God and I'm just the manager, 
it's much easier to be generous with what he's entrusted to me. And the scriptures teach we do that first. Before I spend on me, before I save, the first thing I do is I return back to God out of what he's entrusted to me. Because it's an act of thanksgiving and it's an act of worship and it's an act of faith that says, God, I'm trusting that when I give to you first, you're going to help me to live on the rest. That it all belongs to you anyway, so you're the provider, not my stuff. Secondly, we give to God a percentage. All throughout the scriptures, there's this pattern of God saying a percentage of what you have, return it back to me. He doesn't give a dollar amount, just a percent, because it's not about equal giving, it's about equal sacrifice. In Deuteronomy, they're instructed to do this. Make an offering of 10%, a tithe, bring this into the presence of God, and in this way you will learn to live in deep reverence before God as long as you live. So he says, here's, here's what you do, and here's the why. You bring back 10%, bring it back to God, and when you do this, it teaches you to live in deep reverence before God as long as you live. It helps you to understand God's position and your position. It's a this reminder. And the actual word here is a little archaic. It's called the tithe. And sometimes in our sort of modern day interpretation, we just call that money or giving. But it, it actually means more than that. Tithe means a tenth or 10%. And, and they lived in an agricultural society, and they would take 10% of their crops, and it was the first fruits, and they would bring that back to the Levites who were instructed to care for the temple. This is where God met with the people, and, and there they would bring that to them, and that would be crazy because you don't know if there's going to be a drought. You don't know how the rest of the crop is going to go. You, you would just take the first 10% and bring it and then trust, okay, God, hopefully you're going to help me with the last 90% so I can live on that. But it's a statement. It says, God, I don't want to be dependent on my stuff. I want to be dependent on you. I don't want to find my security and my identity in the things that I have accumulated and acquired. I want my dependence. I want my identity. I want my uh, security to be found in you. Because I recognize, at the end of the day, you're the owner of it all. And, and so I'm trusting you. Now, he, here's sort of where this gets a little bit hairy sometimes. Isn't that Old Testament theology? It's like you're reading from Deuteronomy. Isn't that like the Torah? Isn't that the law of Moses? Isn't that uh, supposed to be just for people living in the Old Testament? And now that we live in the New Testament and Jesus has set us free from the law, we're free from that, and so we don't have to follow that anymore. Let, let's dive into that for just two seconds. Number one, uh, the, in the Old Testament, we are set free from a lot of the rules and regulations of the Old Testament. However, there is a spirit of the law, and there's a letter of the law. When Jesus comes into the world, he sets us free from the letter of the law, but he elevates the spirit of the law. So in the New Testament, when the New Testament authors are writing, when Jesus is talking, the tithe is assumed. And when they talk about generosity, they, they're talking about the tithe as a baseline and generosity from there. That's number one. Number two, whenever we talk about, uh, it's funny, aren't we free from the Old Testament? That always comes up on, whenever we talk about the tithe. Because it's like, I mean... Nobody is using the Old Testament as a way to say, you know what, I really think we should be giving more. Anytime we bring up, aren't we free from the Old Testament, it's like, I think I found the loophole that makes me off the hook from being as generous as you think I should be. That's how we tend to, to use that. And yet, throughout the scriptures, and when Jesus talks, and when he references the Old Testament, he never, he never uses the Old Testament as the higher standard. He always elevates it. So he says things like, hey, you've heard it said in the law that um, if you, thou shalt not murder. But, but I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, if you even have hatred in your heart towards your brother, that's the same as murder. You've heard it said you shouldn't commit adultery. But I'm telling you that even, if you even look at lust with, uh, in your heart at someone, that's the same as adultery. Jesus always takes the, the letter of the law and he looks at the spirit and the intent behind it. And he elevates and says, this is what it looks like, life in my kingdom. And so instead of using the idea that we're free from the law, which we are free from the law because we live in Jesus and we live in the, in the kingdom of God here and now, but let's not use that as a loophole to let ourselves off the hook. Rather, let's elevate the way that Jesus intended for us to ele elevate generosity and the way that the New Testament authors intended for generosity. They, and when we do that, uh, the Apostle Paul comes along in the New Testament. He writes to a guy named Timothy and he says this, teach those who are rich in this world and by the way, that's you and I. By the very fact that you live in the United States of America, you're here. By the very fact that you might be watching online on a computer or a smart device, you're the rich ones. And, and it's hard for us to get our minds around that because I know who the rich people are in my life. They're the people in the tax bracket above me. And for those people, they're not rich. The people who are the rich people are the people in the tax bracket above them. 
right? But if we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, we are rich. We live in the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. And you shouldn't feel guilty for that. You didn't choose where you would be born. You didn't choose any of the things. You didn't choose when you would be born and what family you'd be born to. But we should be aware of that. We should recognize, man, God has blessed me so that I can bless other people. He, Paul writes this, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. See, once you begin to gain more financially, then your natural tendency and my natural tendency is to lean into my wealth, lean into our wealth, and lean into our possessions and trust in our stuff for security, for sense of identity. And if we're not careful, we can shift our trust from God to our stuff. Paul says, don't let that happen. Be generous. In fact, Solomon says this, the rich think of their wealth as a strong defense. They imagine it to be a high wall of safety. They have to imagine it because it actually isn't. It's a, it's a misconception. And then Jesus said this, no one can serve two masters. You'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Hold on, time out, Jesus. Don't you mean God and Satan? Isn't that the, isn't that the polar opposites? Jesus says, no, it's, you can't serve God and money because Jesus knows that it's our tendency as human beings to lean into our wealth, to lean into our stuff, to, to find our identity in that. That the, the number one thing that is competing for the allegiance of our hearts is our money and possessions. And so he says, be generous. Live a generous life. Return back to God. He's the owner. He's entrusted it to you. Return back. Give to God first. Give to God a percentage. And if you will do that, you will experience joy and peace. In fact, here's, here's two things that will happen if you'll choose to live your life this way. Number one, your faith in God grows. Now, this is, again, I've said this before. We don't give so that he'll bless us. We give because he has blessed us. You don't, you don't give so that you can get stock in the church. You're like, hey, you know, I've been giving around here for a while. I think I should get to make some of the decisions around here. I'm a stock owner. Doesn't work like that, right? The Bible doesn't promise if you give, you'll get rich. God's not running a Ponzi scheme, okay? It doesn't say uh, if you love Jesus and give to Jesus, then you're going to be rich and you're going to have sweet rims on your car. There are a lot of people who give faithfully who struggle financially, but they trust God and he provides their needs. But God does promise, I'm going to take care of your needs, and you will feel more alive and experience greater faith than you ever have before because Jesus knows that where our treasure is, our hearts will follow, and what he is after is our hearts. He, he later on writes this, or he's speaking to a group, rather, and Luke records this for us. He says, if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, this is Jesus talking, if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? Now think about it. What are the true riches of heaven? I, I got to tell you, in my own life, I have been blessed in my life far more than I ever thought or imagined I would be. Far more than I deserve. But when I look at the blessings in my life, it's not financial blessings. I've made a commitment in my life to give back to God, uh, to give and start with 10% and be generous from there and to give back to what he's entrusted in me financially because I genuinely trust him. I genuinely believe it is the best way to live. I believe that he created me. I believe that he loves me. And I believe these are the instructions. And that when I live this way, I'm saying, God, you actually created me. You created life. So you know how life should operate and you have my best interest at heart, so I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to obey you in this area of my life. Now, I can tell you, as a result of that, I realize I've been given some of the true riches of heaven. Things like family relationships, things like leadership and influence and opportunities and friendships that last forever. And when you're faithful with something temporary like money, God says, that's someone I can trust with the true riches of heaven. And unfortunately, some of us are desperate to experience some of the true riches of heaven, but we haven't proven ourselves faithful and generous with the temporary currency of money. And ironically, this is so ironic because some of the prayer requests that we get all the time are people saying, God, help me during this season of my life. I'm facing financial struggles. I'm facing a shortage. I need help in this season of my life. And that genuinely happens. But there are so many people that I encounter who are praying, God, uh, I think it's ironic. I, I really need your help in this season of my life financially. But I don't really want to follow your way of handling my finances when I have plenty. God, I need, I need you to be in the center of my finances because I really need you now. But when I have plenty, I, uh, I don't really want God in the center of my finances because he's asking me to give back to him. But man, when I'm in need, God, I really need you to be in the center of my finances. 
And it's ironic. What if instead we just said, God, I trust your way is the best way, and I'm going to take a step of obedience in that direction. If you want your faith in God to grow, and you want to continue to move towards spiritual maturity, very few things will do that, like consistent generosity. Because it's not about more, it's about managing what God has entrusted to you. If you want to grow spiritually, you direct your heart towards those things. So number one, when you decide to live this way, your faith in God will grow. Secondly, God's mission is accomplished. I mean, just like with serving, God always works through people. And when we take what God has entrusted to us and we return it back through our local church, God uses our collective efforts as a church to make a difference here in the world. It's, it's amazing how that happens. And uh, in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes this, Since you excel in so many ways, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Now, I want you to know, I, I'm not downplaying any of the gifts that we receive here because collectively God uses every penny, God uses every single thing that every person gives to make a difference. And look at what God has been able to accomplish through this church with the resources that have been given. I'm telling you, it's far more than I ever thought we'd get in my entire lifetime. I never thought in 15 years this is where we would be. But I do want to inspire you to think about what we could accomplish together if even more of us determined to live life this way. To say, God, I'm going to give to you first, and I'm going to give to you a percent. And what if everyone here, this is such a sobering thing to think about, what if every single person here gave to the degree that you gave? What if every person here matched their uh, percentage and their generosity up to yours? Would this church do even greater things, or would this church cease to exist? It's a sobering thing to think about. And And I know some of you are thinking this, I hate talks like this, ugh. When is he going to be done? But it's possible. It's possible that that might be an area in your heart that God is just pressing on a little bit to say, this is where I want you to grow. This is where I want you to take a step of obedience. And uh, I'm asking you to trust that God will provide for you when you make his kingdom your primary concern. And because I want to inspire you to give back 10% to God through your local church, I want you to know I'm not asking you to do something our family doesn't do, that our staff doesn't do, and also that we don't do as a church. Every single month, we take 10% and we tithe as a church and we give 10% away back into God's kingdom through overseas global partners. In fact, uh, one of our global partners uh, filmed a little video this week to share with us a story that took place because of your generosity. So check this out. Hey, Westbridge Church, this is Dana looking with Children's Cup. I just want to say a huge thank you for your extreme generosity. The way you're helping us help kids is really changing their lives. There's one story who came out of Belize, a kid named Kendis, 12 years old. We're doing food distribution. He shows up with his bike and he says, hey, can I help distribute this food? Can I help deliver the food to other kids? And so the team, they're all excited seeing him volunteering like that. This is back in February. Every day since then that we've done food distribution, he showed up with his bike and ridden around town delivering food to other kids. That's exciting to us because our dream is to give hope, to inspire dreams, and to help these kids change their worlds from the inside out. That's what Kendis is doing. He's taking it on himself to be something greater than what his world tells him he can be. That's because of you guys giving. It's because of the opportunity God is giving because of prayer, because of faithfulness, but it's also because of you guys and the way you give so generously. So I just want to say thank you for changing Kendis's life and for changing the lives of so many other kids. God bless you. We love you guys. Dan is the uh, director of Children's Cup, and they're one of our global partners. And uh, it's awesome because what's happening is because of your generosity as a church, because every time that you give to Westbridge Church, 10% of that goes overseas. And so uh, it's amazing that through your generosity, now you got a kid in Belize who has experienced the generosity of God towards him. And now he's taken it upon himself to take what he's been entrusted and to use that to be generous towards others. That ripple effect is incredible. God's kingdom moves forward through our generosity because we serve a God who is generous toward us. For God so loved the world that he gave And I just think that that's incredible. And I want every single one of us to consider returning 10% of everything God entrusts to us back to his work in this world. And if I'm honest, somebody did that for you. When we started this church, again, we sat in a living room 15 years ago today, and we had churches in San Diego and in Washington and in Texas who said, we, we, don't, we know you, Jeremiah, but uh, we'll probably never be in Minnesota. We're never going to attend your church, but we're going to give. 
people who were a part of a church in San Diego, a part of a church in Washington, a part of a church in Texas, said, we're going to give. We're going to give to you because somebody gave so that we could be a part of a church here in our area. And we want to make sure if you're starting a church that's going to be like this and helping people find and follow Jesus in the northwest suburbs of the Twin Cities, then we want to give to you. And you're sitting in a seat that was paid for by somebody who wanted to be a part of God's kingdom expanding in the world. That's amazing. You're here because somebody somewhere else 15 years ago gave 10% to their local church, and that church helped us get started, and now we want to continue to do the same thing for people around the world. And so here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say three things, and then we'll close. Number one, this is not a message of help. We need your money, okay? I've heard that in churches before, and it's like, listen, guys, it's been a rough season, and uh, if you don't give, we've got to close the doors in three weeks, okay? This is not that. I want to be really clear. In fact, we made a commitment early on that we would never teach about giving and generosity from a position of need. Okay, so we're doing great as a church. We're healthy. This is not because we need something from you. This is because I want something for you. I want you to be able to step into what the scriptures teach in this area and experience the joy that comes from living the way that God instructs us to live. So this isn't, this isn't something that we need. This is something that we are just instructing. This is what the scriptures teach. We want this for you. Second, you need to know this. When we continue to grow in spiritual maturity, generosity is just one of those areas that's affected. And we're naturally able to do more ministry. So the staff salaries are already set. Budgets already get set. Nobody gets more money based off of what comes in. If we continue to grow in generosity, all that happens is that we get to do more ministry. We get to give more money away to our global partners, and we get to do more ministry here in our community. That's what happens. And so this isn't like, a, hey, if you give, uh, nobody's bonuses are attached to this. Nobody's salaries are attached to this. And I think it's important that you know that. All that happens is the more that comes in, the more ministry we get to do, the more people we get to reach. And then third, you need to know this. Just like in this area, some of you are like, man, I heard 10% and you like swallowed your gum. You're just like, oh my gosh. But listen, if that sounds overwhelming to you, just like in every area of our lives where God asks us to do something, just start moving in that direction. Take a step of obedience in that direction. So if you're like, I don't even know, I can't even wrap my brain around that. How, how would I do that? Start with 4%. Start with 6%. I don't know. Pick something, move in that direction, and say, okay, I'm going to give to God first, and God, I'm going to try to give 5% to you. And I'm going to try that first. And start doing that. Start taking a step of obedience in that direction. Okay? And to help you do that, I want to alleviate any fears. And at the risk of sounding like a late-night infomercial, here it is. We do the 90-day tithe challenge. And here's what that means. Try this. Try it for 90 days. Try giving back to God first, giving God a percentage for 90 days. And if at the end of 90 days you say, man, my heart, my faith hasn't grown. I don't feel like I'm participating in God's kingdom. Like there's zero benefit to you at the end of it. Then you literally let us know and say, you know what? This, is, this isn't done anything for me. And we will give you every penny back, no questions asked. Again, very late night infomercial, I recognize. But I want to eliminate any of the fears or any of the barriers that you have to responding in obedience in this particular area of your life. Because I genuinely believe that when you do this, your faith will grow and you will feel what it's like to participate in God's kingdom here in this world. So, for God so loved that he gave. And if you would like to say yes to the invitation of Jesus, this is a generous God who's always moving in our direction. And every one of us has experienced brokenness between God and ourselves and ourselves and other people. And yet we were created for community with God and others, loving community. And so at the right time, this generous God moved in our direction. He didn't wait for us to figure things out. He sent Jesus into the world for God so loved that he gave. And then Jesus gave of himself, and he allowed himself to be put to death on the cross. And then according to multiple eyewitnesses, he rose from the dead. (coughs) And that means there's more to this life than this life, and death is not the end. And you and I have been invited by this generous God back into loving community with God and loving community with one another. And if you've never said yes to that before, I want to invite you to say yes as we close in prayer. For some of you, it's this. Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the 90-day challenge. Just write 90-day challenge on the back of your connection card. For others of you, you'd say this. I want to say yes to a team. How do I do that? There's a bunch of them on the wall right back here. Talk to somebody. Fill out a card. Say yes. We'll get you plugged in. For others of you, you'd say this. I want to say yes to following Jesus. And you can just agree with this prayer. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times that I've walked away from you. And I thank you that in your generosity, you continue to move in my direction. And so I want to say yes to the opportunity to be a part of your family. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And then help me. And I know I'm going to stumble a bunch along the way, but help me to follow you. Help me to put my trust in you. Help me to take steps of obedience 
I, I believe that you created me, that you love me, that your way of living life is the best way to live. And I want to submit my way of living to yours. And I want to give you the steering wheel of my life, every area of my life. Help me as I do that. And God, I pray for every one of us that when it comes to what has been entrusted to us, that we would recognize you're the owner, we're the managers. That you'd give us the courage, the faith to manage well what has been entrusted to us. That we wouldn't think about more, but that we would think about management. And that we would be a church that is generous our faith would grow and that we'd make a difference in the world. Thank you, and we pray this in your name. Amen.